Maybe a legacy isn't material. Maybe a person's impact can't be determined by a calculator. Maybe the ripples of our time on earth, the love we show, the faith we share, the good we do, the people we help, maybe they go on forever. This is my story. Good morning. How are you guys? Good? Well, it's good to see you guys uh, here today. Uh, if you're our guest today, just as Pastor Derek's already said, we're just honored that you guys would choose to be here at Cultivate Church. Literally, we do know uh, that you could be anywhere. So it's just our honor to have you as our guest today. Uh, and if it is your first day with us and you haven't been here over the past couple of weeks, we are uh, in the third part of a series that we've entitled, This Is My Story. And this has been a really, really powerful month. Uh, it's been my favorite month, I think, of our messages all together because uh, we say at Cultivate Church all the time, we're just doing life together. We're just in this thing called life together. And uh, we know that everybody doesn't have it all figured out and everybody doesn't have it all put together. And uh, every week, I tell you so many times, I wake up every day just saying, God, uh, I'm yours all over again today. And I want to do the best I can to represent you today, God. And uh, I just want to be the best that I can be. And in the very first week, uh, Pastor Brandon Dawes talked to us about our story and really taught us that our story matters and that our story is powerful. And then last week, I shared my personal story with you and just what to do when the when, uh, when the fairy tale ends and when you feel like your uh, fairy tale life that you're living in doesn't kind of uh, mount up to be what you thought or hoped it was going to be and how to respond and how to act to that. But today, uh, I'm joined by my beautiful, uh, better half, Jen Matthews. And uh, can y'all just kind of clap for her, make her feel welcome out here this morning? Uh, she's just a, a little nervous, but I think she'll be okay uh, since you guys made her feel so uh, welcome and at home. Uh, but we're just going to share her story this morning because how many of you know stories matter? And life change happens. I, we actually have it at the top of your outline uh, that the Bible says that we are made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by what? the word of our testimony. So we believe that every time we come together and every time we share our lives with each other, that people are made overcomers, that we are made overcomers because God honors the fact that you share. Uh, in our uh, scripture in the past couple of weeks, we shared the verse of scripture, uh, 1 Peter 3.15, that says to always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give a reason. So uh, we've just kind of been encouraging each other to know what is our reason. What's the, what's the whole backstory of the reason that we came to Christ and that we gave him our 100% and our everything. So this morning, we're just going to share uh, Jen's story with you. And in your uh, worship guide is an outline for today's message. And I just encourage you to, to grab that outline. And we're just going to talk through. Uh, I'm just going to kind of ask Jen some questions. And we're going to talk through her story today. And then in just a few minutes, there's a, there's a passage of scripture, a, a story in, in the book of John that really just parallels Jen's story and what God's done in her life so well that I want to share with you as we kind of talk through her story. But I just want us to pray, and let's just ask God just to be here with us today and for him to speak to us. How many of you know it's got nothing to do with anything we say up here today? It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit and God speaking to us that life change happens. But because of God's word, our lives can truly be changed. Not just a, something that we do on Sunday morning, but we can truly leave differently when God meets here with us and brings life change through his word. So let's pray together. God, I love you so much, and I thank you, God, that uh, God, that you've brought us here, that you've given us this opportunity, God, to put a church in, in Shelby County, God, full of people who love you and who love each other, God, full of people who look across this city, who look across this county and just says, God, just send us the people that, God, that are alone, the people that are hurting. Let us do life together. Let us go through this and love you and serve you the best we can by just doing this thing called life together and experiencing what it means to live life on purpose. And this morning, God, as we go into your word and as Pastor Jen shares her heart with us and her story, I just pray that you'd open our ears that we hear you speak to us today, God. And I pray, God, that you'd open our minds so that we understand what it is that you're saying to us and open our hearts, God, so that we can just retain it. That we don't leave here, God, just having heard your word, but we leave here being doers so that our lives are changed and not only our lives, but by the lives of others around us, God. And we just give you all the credit for what you do in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the best place to start uh, with a story is always the beginning, right? You get the best, uh, the backstory when you have to set up and know what's going on. So, uh, so, Jen, just tell us just a little bit about your life, about your story, about what it was like to grow up in the Kendrick household. Um, well, growing up, 
was always really great. We lived um, in a Christian household. Church was everything. We were probably there the day after we were born. Like, it was just what we did. We had all the frilly dresses that would choke you when you sat down, hated them. It was just what we always did. My parents were always very good influences. My grandparents were missionaries and pastors, and um, it was just our life, and even uh, always lived a very straight-laced life up into my teen years even, and really even then felt a call to worship and led worship at a um, local church when I was a teenager, and it was all pretty gravy. You know, it's actually a, um, it's actually a pretty interesting little part of our story and our history. Uh, the church that I served on staff at uh, before we planted this church here, uh, I met the pastor just through relationship, and, and once uh, about the same time I had met Jen, and, and we had kind of started talking and building a relationship, a friendship together, and turns out that the pastor that, um, who helped us launch this church uh, was there the day that Jen was born, uh, gave her a, a little porcelain doll the, the morning that she was uh, brought into this world in the hospital room, and we found all of that out, you know, that we were connected later on, and uh, even farther back than that, the church that we were serving at, that my pastor pastors her grandfather and grandmother pastored that church years and years ago. So it was really neat to, to learn Jen and, and to see her, her backstory in her life and to hear these stories of them growing up and how they grew up in a Christian household and all the heritage that was stretched back uh, between uh, Jen's life growing up. And I can even say, by being a part of the family now, uh, like every Christmas morning, you know, her dad reads the Christmas story and, you know, prays a special prayer for birthdays and, and you know, holidays. I mean, it's just that type of household. And I didn't grow up that way, so that's just like culture shock for me. And I'm thinking, wow, this is, you know, pretty incredible. So when you just hang out there for just a Sunday afternoon dinner even, you can really tell the way, uh, you know, Jen grew up in her life. But so all the way up through the teenage years, you kind of gave your heart to God. You were living, you know, real straight lace, grew up in a real Christian household, and were very involved, I guess, in youth group even as a teenager. Yeah. Um, so tell me just a little about how that part of your life went, your teenage years. Um, well, when I was a teenager, well, when I became an older teenager, I guess, I moved to Mobile, and that was when... Um, the first bit part of my life began to change, really, I guess, because I had just been in high school and leading worship and whatever, just under my parents' roof. And then when I was 19, I moved down to Mobile and just decided I was a big girl and needed to get out on my own. And it was pretty easy transition because we had a lot of family down there, too. And so I really even had a church home away from home, really, because we went there so often that I had friends at this church and everything. So it was kind of just a real simple first move away. And so I had instant friends, instant relationships, and became, became um, a part of their youth team. So I was one of their youth leaders in the youth group there and served every single weekend and then every single Wednesday night for the youth service and um, even ended up dating one of the guys, somebody down there that I'd built relationship with for years and years. Um, and that was probably the biggest turning point of my life because I was still pretty innocent for a lot of things, even um, really my spiritual life was very innocent because everything I'd done so far was under my parents' roof and because I was really told to go, I was okay with it. I didn't rebel against it, but it was still just because it was what I was told to do. Um, so for the first time I was out on my own and had to kind of make decisions on my own. And since I didn't really know what I was doing, um, I've never been one to ask a whole, whole lot of questions. And so when I started dating this guy, he seemed to have all the answers and so without realizing what I was doing, I'd kind of equated them as the same thing, like church was this guy and this guy was church, like it was all kind of the same thing. Um, that became a weird relationship after time because in his eyes I was perfect, but then had at one point learned about a mistake I'd made earlier in my um, teenage years. I have been touring around leading worship with this band and um, was dating one of the guys in it and we ended up having sex and it was a mistake like we were both very sorry about it we weren't bad kids it just happened didn't expect it but to me as innocent as I was and everything that just my world crushed and I had already been through all those emotions and those feelings and that chapter was closed like me and God were finally fine you know, and myself, I still struggled with feelings of, well, this isn't how you were supposed to be. This isn't how it was supposed to go down. You know, you're saving yourself for marriage and all this. And so I was already kind of destroyed inside of myself after that decision. But I had kind of dealt with those emotions on my own. It was years earlier. Well, finds out and um, 
it just became this huge thing because he was not okay with the fact that that chapter was closed in my life. It became very slowly a very verbally abusive relationship. I was told all the time that I was worthless and um, that I had to earn his love and I would never be good enough for anybody else. And so I just needed to take whatever he dished out. And to me now, and really me earlier in my life, I just can't help but think, are you kidding me? Like, nobody can talk to me like that. Why would you let anybody talk to you like that and tell them you're not worth anything? And Sometimes I just look at her wrong and, it, you know, I didn't even <laughs> say anything. And I can tell you it's not okay just to look sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But so it just became really, really bad. I mean, honestly, even if I didn't do anything, if he was mad at some random person, he would yell at me and beat me to the ground till I was just crying, crying, crying. And um, really, truly, it happened so slowly, he had me convinced that it was all true. Uh, to even the point that his mother pulled me aside and begged me to leave him. She was like, I've seen you go from here to here, and it's not worth it. Like, he's being wrong to you. He's not in the right. The things he's saying is not true. All this stuff, and I didn't listen to her. And I don't know why, but at some point, some straw broke the camel's back because we did break up. So basically, you, you make a mistake. And how many of you know that sometimes when you, when you find yourself, you've been knocked down, you, you're, you're surprised at the number of people who try to gather around and kick you while you're down. And you think it's the opposite. And sometimes what's so hurtful is you think it's the people who are really going to be there to help you and lift you up that you find just love to rejoice when you're down. And, and the problem in this situation is now here you are hurt and now you're being kind of talked down to. But not only are, are, are you dating this guy who's now in a, a troubled, a bad relationship for you, that all of your friends and your church, everything is wrapped around this one relationship. So exactly what would you say that that did to your church relationship? With going to church, being a part of that, how did it affect just your church life? Awkward. <laughs> in a word. Um, it, it was very awkward. All of our friends were mutual friends, and they had known him for a whole lifetime, and they only knew me for a few years. And so even though we were great friends, you're going to go with your childhood friend. And so just to prevent it being super weird, I just kind of started to back off a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, it really kind of... Basically put you out of church? Yeah, yeah, eventually it did because it just became, it just got weirder and weirder, as you can imagine. Um, so I kind of kept backing off and um, eventually just started missing church and missing church because of it. And when nobody called to ask me where I was or why I wasn't at church or what's wrong, um, sorry about all this, like nobody even called, like nobody said a word. So it was easy for me to equate it all with church people are like this, churches like this, because not only had this person that I equated with everything that was church and everything that was God and church people, he just completely drug me into the ground like I had no more self-worth. Now everybody else in the church that I thought were friends just disregarded me too. So in my mind, mm -hmm. why stick with this? If a few people are supposed to be living up to this and you don't, then I'll just go hang out with people who aren't trying to live up to anything and I won't be disappointed. You know, that's one reason we talk about small groups so much here at Cultivate Church. And, you know, you saw in the announcement that we're even doing a small group training because our semester begins June 3rd. It's because of those exact situations. I mean, you know, involved in a church and suddenly a bad circumstance, a bad mistake, you know, escalates to something that it never should have been. If somebody had just cared enough just to come and say, you know what, I, I just want to do life with you. I want to I come beside you. I want to help you to overcome this. Let's, let's dig in together and let's, let's, let's be uh, overcomers together. But the exact opposite happened there. And, and the story is, honestly, I hate to say it, but just on behalf of the church, we do a bad uh, job so many times at, at missing people and not loving people when they're down and not loving people when they've made a mistake. And when we say discover what it means to live life on purpose at Cultivate Church, that means our doors are open for everybody who's made a mistake. We pray every week that people walk in these doors who've made a mistake and who just need to know that God loves them. And that's why we came and, and, and planted this church. That's who the church that we want to be. And for the reason is, because you can see, after you got out of church, I mean, what was the next chapter of your life like? What happened next? Well, it slowly became a very, slowly became a quick downward spiral uh, once I started to make new friends outside of the church. Um, I got exposed to a whole world of things I had never known in the church. Um, got into relationships and was drinking all of a sudden, and I'd never drank before at all, so I did it all in excess. Got introduced to cocaine and other drugs and um 
just sex was no longer one mistake I'd made, but it was just a habit. It was what was going on in my life, and um, it just felt like I was spinning out of control. So once the spiral started, I mean, you, you, you take the, the, the picture you see here of somebody who was raised, who knows God, who'd had that personal relationship, and because of hurt, because of disappointment, because of uh, all the things that come along with what the enemy tries to throw on you when, when you find yourself in a bad circumstance in life and nobody to do life with and to connect with, and now the spiral's happening. So what was the big culmination? I mean, what was the big outcome of all these mistakes and where your life ended up? Well, through all of that in that chapter, I um, ended up pregnant, for one, and um, my dad and my sister, Allie, who's usually here, actually came all the way down to Mobile from here in Birmingham to give me a good talking to and take me back, to Mo take me back up here to Birmingham, take me home. And um, I think the hardest, obviously, when you're young and you hear that you're pregnant and you're with somebody you don't care about, and... I mean, that's a big deal in itself, but really even beyond all of that, it was just what killed me was my family. Like, I hurt my family so bad. They didn't know what they could trust. They didn't know, um, you know, they just didn't know if I was the same person or what was going on inside my head. They, you know, had helped me out financially different times because I was blowing all my money on different things and just were felt betrayed because they felt like all that money went to drugs or to something, and there's really no telling what it went to. And... um that just that's what broke my heart because my mom I like to say has a little bit more grace to her she could um, love me with a smile and even though she I knew what was going on behind the smile but my dad um, is a lot more like me and can't lie about anything and shows it all on his face so we didn't talk very much for quite a while and that I think was the worst that was the worst pain of all of it even besides where I was in my own self so what was the process? How did that, how did that turn out? Tell us about uh, the relationship with your dad and, and the pregnancy. What, what happened there? Um, it felt like forever, like I might have gone a couple of years, but it was really a couple of months into the pregnancy, and my dad hadn't spoken to me. And then finally, we were just randomly sitting in the kitchen together, and just out of nowhere, he said something about putting up a swing set. And I was thinking, oh, my God, we're okay. Like, we hadn't said a word about it, and we didn't say a word after that, but he said something about putting up a swing set, and I knew in my heart that me and my dad would be okay, and our relationship kind of back, got back to normal after that, and it was really crazy because not three days later, I had a miscarriage, and it was one of those things that just took me so off guard because I knew that me and my dad had just repaired our relationship. What is going on? Like, if it is not one thing, it is another. Like, I was at peace with everything because I was at peace with my dad. And so this happens. And um, we go to the hospital, and I had waited for hours and hours and hours because beyond what I should have waited, we should have gone on to the hospital, but I was just trying to figure out my thoughts and stuff. So we go, my dad goes with me, and it was bizarre because they did ultrasounds and stuff to make sure they really, you know, what was happening was really happening, and they couldn't find a baby anywhere, which was weird because they said every single thing else about your body says that you are pregnant, like you are fully where you're supposed to be to be pregnant, and there is no baby, um, which was crazy because it just put, I guess, all of us at peace. It felt like I was in no position to pray to God, but I knew that God had his hand on my life right then because I knew that had I had a miscarriage before me and my dad repaired a relationship, it would have never been okay because it would have been okay because I didn't have a baby. It wouldn't have been okay because we were okay. And, and even the fact that I can sit here now and say I didn't lose someone, you know, it's just I felt like it was two big things right there in one that God, you know, you could see something good happening in my life. So, so after that blessing, you ever been there where you think you finally get that second chance? You know, you, you got this break and you feel like God's working. Did that change anything at all? Did, did it change your habits, your, your direction in life? Did you flip things around at that point? I, I felt like I was going to. I stayed in the house and did never leave for about a month because I was scared of doing life on my own again. And then finally decided it was okay. And instead of just being safe and kind of easing out there. I went downtown Birmingham to find a job and um, ended up starting to drink slowly again with different friends downtown, ended up moving downtown and um, got a so job. Right back in the middle of it all. Yeah. Even from moving to a clean place, thank you, starting over, and it's all right back in the middle of it. Yeah. You ever notice sometimes that 
Uh, you feel like once you're so far down, you're, you're in that hole, you feel like you'll never get back out. And when we look at people and we go, uh, you know, and, I, and hearing Jen's story, I'd go, well, how in the world did you not take that opportunity to dig yourself out of that hole? Why in the world did you not, um, you know, get everything straight at that, point, that moment when you had the opportunity? But it's like sometimes when you feel like you're so defeated, it's hard to get back up. And the truth is, as we sit here and we take in what she's saying and her story and we try to breathe a little bit as we you know, hang on to the edge of our seat of what she says, we can all think this morning of, of moments of our own lives where we've been and where mistakes have happened, where trouble has come, and maybe you feel like you were just absolutely covered up, like there is no way out, that you made a mistake or did something that you never thought that you would do. That you said yes when you never thought you'd have said yes to that. When you uh, went to that place that you never thought you would go, no matter what you thought life would happen, it's just different. And the truth is there's many people who walk in here every week and maybe you just feel, uh, you just feel defeated. You feel overcome. But this is what I want to do. I, I want you to grab your outline, if you will. And I want us to talk through a, a verse of a scripture, a story out of, out of uh, John. And I want you to take a look at what's happening in this story. And it's a man that Jesus encounters one day. And the saying goes that right inside the city gate was a pool. And uh, it was believed a tradition that every now and then, you never knew when this was going to happen, but randomly, the water of this small pool, and you can kind of picture it as like a, uh, a small body of water that was encased in concrete. And all the people who were sick would gather around this pool and they would wait for the water just to mysteriously begin to bubble and to stir. And what they really believed in the, in the day was that if you could get in that water, you could be healed of whatever your sickness was. Whatever was wrong with you, you could get in that water and you could be healed. Now, what they really believe is, is the truth is that it was just an underground spring. It had nothing to do with anything spiritual. And just every now and then, the, the water would, would move and it would cause bubbles to come up. And the water moved. That was about the only spiritual aspect of it. But they actually believed this. And one day, Jesus comes by and there's a man who's been sick for 30 38 years who's been laying by this water. Uh, I don't know how long he's been laying by this water, but the Bible just tells us he's been sick for 38 years, so a very long time. And Jesus comes along and asks this guy a question. And you ever read the Bible sometimes and you just think, that just does not make sense at all. Like, I know Jesus is the Son of God, but the, what he says to this man, I just kind of shake my head and go, that has got to be the dumbest question that I've ever heard asked in my whole life. And it's coming from Jesus. Like, I don't understand your thought process. But, but here's what he says. Look at your outline with me. In John chapter 5, verse 6, this, this is what it says. It says, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now, maybe you think like me, maybe you're more spiritual than I am, I don't know. But I'm looking, thinking, if I'm seeing a man who's been sick for a very long time, the first question I would ask is not, do you want to get well? I mean, I would automatically assume that a sick man wants to get well. Wouldn't you automatically assume that somebody that's blind wants to see? And if you've got the power of sight, why do you even have to ask such a question? But the first thing Jesus starts, his first interaction with this man is asking him a question. And the first blank that I put on your outline is it's forcing this guy to make a decision. To make a decision. When Jesus says, hey, do you want to get well? Here's what Jesus did. He, he, as the old saying goes, he put the ball in, in that man's court. And whereas I would look at Jen's story and I just kind of shake my head and go, man, why would you not take this opportunity? It's almost like Jesus looking at you and going, do you want to get well? Do you want your life to change? Do you want things to be different? When we come in here every week and we worship and we sing and, and we proclaim God and the goodness of God, we, we don't do that just because it's something to do. We do that because we're proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ and the truth that he can change any person's life no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been. But the question is, do you want to get well? Do you want your life to change? You know, I think about this man, and I think maybe he didn't want his life to change. Maybe he liked getting handouts. Maybe he liked somebody coming along and just doing things for him because he couldn't do for himself. Maybe he liked all the attention that he received from being sick. I don't know what his excuse was, but Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? So the first thing I would ask you this morning as, as, we, as we look into our own life and see what's going on in, inside of us and ask yourself the question, do I want things to be different? Do I really want God to step in and change things? So for you, you, you weren't um, 
you know, you haven't given God your life at this point, but you finally hit a moment where you did want things to change and begin kind of cleaning some stuff up. So, so where was that process for you? How did that start for you? Um, I think just as time went on, I started seeing how silly a lot of stuff was in my life. Like, I thought all these people, I had so many friends and the, all this, but if I ever needed to get in touch or needed something from them or needed, they weren't friends at all. And my eyes were just slowly starting to be open to things I'd just been overlooking for this whole, for years. And, um, so I just really made a decision strictly based on the fact that I thought it was stupid and I was over it. So I just started, I stopped going out. I just started staying home again. Yeah, so, like was, so part of it is, is you just made the decision on your own to kind of stop hanging out with a friend, stop going to downtown, stop the drinking. Mm -hmm. And if you'll notice, this is a decision that she made on her own. That it hasn't, you know, Jesus is asking this guy, do you want to get well? And, and nothing's happened yet. And G Jen just made a decision in her life that she said, you know, I'm going to start moving in the right direction. And so many times we come to church and we get afraid to move forward because we think we have to clean ourselves up, that we have to get everything right before we can go to the church, before we can go to God. And if you've had friends or people that you've asked to church and they'll say, I'm going to come one day, but I just got some things that I need to take care of first or some things that I need to straighten out. But at Cultivate Church, people don't have to do that. I've never been fishing and caught a, a perfectly filleted fish that's just ready to put on the plate and eat. They're always smelly, and they always are, you know, you got to clean them and, you know, all that stuff that you got to do with a fish before you can even eat it. And I just say this, we, we want to just catch the fish. We want people to come like they are because we're just doing life together. So you made a decision, which is what Jesus is asking this guy. And the number two in your outline, I put this down. Uh, the next thing that kind of comes in this story is that he had to quit blaming other people. The man that Jesus is talking to had to quit blaming other people. Because this is what he said. He said, I, he said, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. So here's the thing. The immediate thing he says to Jesus, when he's looking at the man who's got all the power to change, he starts throwing out his excuses as to why uh, that he couldn't be changed. Well, I, I can't get in the water. Nobody will help me this, that, or the other. And the truth is, when we present an opportunity for Jesus to change our life, most of us have some great excuses that we come up with. And it's normal. It's just scripture. All the way back from the very beginning, uh, how many of you know that uh, Adam blamed Eve when he you know, ate of the fruit? He said, Hey, God, the woman gave me the fruit, and I ate it. You know, that's all I know to say is it's her fault. We have this tendency inside of us to shift the blame and to put it on somebody else. And for you, the, the things that you look back, I mean, there were some common things in your life. I mean, what were the major common things of blame that you were putting in your life? Well, it was easy to blame the church, and it was easy to blame the person in that relationship just because I felt like they're the reason I made these decisions in the first place, like, I felt like all my life was to compensate for all the things that were done to me. And so it's easy to put blame there. Yeah, it's, isn't, that, isn't that true that we can all, we don't have to look far to find the blame or the, the things that's wrong with us? But how many of you know that when you get past yourself, part of the blame game is that it makes you feel better. It makes you feel better. It makes me feel better about the decisions that I've made in my own life. Because I can say, well, if it wasn't for this or if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be this way. But the truth is, none of us have enough blame or enough reason to say that we don't have enough control over our own self. We have the decisions, the power to make good choices in our own life. We have the decision to say yes to God or to no to God. So the, so the first thing you've got to do is you've got to begin to make a decision that you want the change to happen. And number two, you've got to stop blaming the people in your life for where you are and for what's going on. And number three in the right line, write this down, is you have to make a personal effort. You have to make a personal effort. You've got to do something. Here's what the conversation goes with Jesus and this man. It says, Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once the man was cured, he picked up his mat, and he walked. Jesus said, you pick up your mat, and you walk. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense either because Jesus is talking to a lame man who can't do that. The man could have again said, but you don't understand. I haven't walked in 38 years. I've been this way for, there's no way I can get up and I can begin to move. Jesus, if I could get up and I could move, then I wouldn't need this conversation to be happening right here. But instead, he stopped blaming other people. And when Jesus said to pick up your mat and walk, that's exactly what the man did. 
And at that moment, he was healed. Everything in his life began to change. That was the moment when he connected, that everything began to shift in this man's life. And for you, Jen, you, you're already making these decisions and getting past the point of, of blaming the people around you for what happened. And you're at that moment where the breakthrough happens in your life and, and things start to shift and turn around, even with your connection with God, where he begins to come in and make things change. So just tell us a little bit about how that happened. Well, I'd already begun to go back to church, to my parents' church, because I kind of got tricked into leading worship there, of all things. Was not ready to lead worship. He totally took a chance on me. Um, and so I was leading worship for the youth group at uh, my parents' church in Trustful. And just one night was my at once moment. I don't even know what the altar call was about. I don't know. All I know is I was nowhere near high school anymore. And so I don't know if it even applied to me, but I went up because I was like, I just, I'm ready. Something's got to change because up until this point, I've been trying to make good decisions because I knew I wanted to get on a different path than I'd been on, but God hadn't got a hold of my life yet. But, um, so I went up for this altar call and a lady that was a friend of our family came up and prayed, uh, with me because I'd become the daughter that was on the prayer list in Sunday school, you know, <laughs> that kid you hear about for years and then they finally show up and it's like, oh, rejoice. And so she comes up to pray with me and I couldn't even, I couldn't do anything. I wasn't praying. I wasn't saying anything. I was just crying and I hadn't cried in years and it was just, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was going to come tomorrow, but I just knew that was at once. I was different. I knew it was done. My life was changed. I'll never forget that night because I was there. Uh, this is the season of, uh, of Jen's life that she and I actually met. And if you were here last week, uh, Pastor Jen was not the topic of my, of my talk last week. So uh, <laughs> just so we clarify that, I'm out of the doghouse and I'm clear now, okay? Uh, we can resume life together now. Uh, but actually, at this stage of, of Jen's life is when she and I met. And uh, I'll never forget that um, we met one night. Uh, I was at a tent revival. Uh, if you know what a tent revival is, it's just a tent on the side of the road, and you, and you preach under it, and people come. And it was at a really bad part of town. I mean, like, really a part of the town where I should have had a gun in my back pocket, you know, just in case, like that kind of town. And so she shows up, and I had no idea she was coming. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what is she doing here? We need somebody to, to stand with her, to protect her, and, you know, watch over. And uh, I stayed and helped take this tent down when it was over that night. And she just kind of hung around, and I thought, why is she here? Because we had connected at the same church for a little while. We were both helping the same youth pastor friend. And um, so anyway, we, we went to dinner after that uh, meeting that night. And I just asked her, I was like, why were you there? And, and so she just said, I, I don't know. I just felt like I, I wanted to come. And I want, I, you said you're preaching, so I wanted to come here. And the moment we had our first conversation just at dinner that night, I, God just did something really special. We just became just absolute great friends. And as we're going through this process, and I'm, you know, I love God, I'm, I'm devoted to God, and, and here I have this friend who I see is working through this stuff. And Jen had even uh, kind of accumulated some debt during this period of, of her life. And so she's, you know, she's making good decisions. I can see her moving in the right direction, saying, you know, I need to pay off some of this debt. And uh, so part of her job that she had learned to do while she was downtown was she'd become a bartender. And how she ended up in that is just another story. But she said it's quick, easy money. And as she's making these good decisions, and I see she's moving forward, she says, you know, I think I could just go get a silly bartending job, and I can pay this debt off really fast. And, you know, she's in church at this moment, and I'm just shaking my head thinking, this is never going to work. This girl is never going to get this. Like, I don't know if this is ever going to happen. But as we go through the process, and I just begin to see growth change in her life. And I remember standing in the back of that room the night that, that she just went up for prayer. And I just saw everything break. And I just saw her walk away a completely different person. Because in a moment, I really saw her. For, for months leading up to that night, I had saw her doing everything she could do to make the difference happen. I seen her trying to make every good decision. I saw her trying to find ways to pay the debt, to get new friends. I'll never forget one day she walked in and she said, you know what? She said, here's my new phone number. She said, I changed my phone number today. And I said, why did you change your phone number? She said, because I don't want anybody in my past to be able to get a hold of me. She said, I'm blocking that whole part of my life out. But after that one night that I saw that everything came together and I saw her break, I knew that it was no longer her fighting and, and scratching and clawing to make it happen. 
But God had come in and God had transformed her life. And everything in that moment was different. Everything had changed in her life. That she made a personal effort. And number four, here's what I would say that you have to do. At this moment, once you've seen God come in and you've made that effort to connect and he's changed your life, is you, you don't look back. You, you can't look back. You can't bring up yesterday. You can't let anybody get in your face and say, well, you remember how you used to be or what you used to be. You can't do that anymore. Because when God comes into your life and God sets you free, it truly is a brand new page. We titled this message, A Brand New Page. You ever been writing something or writing a story and you just have to wad it up, throw it away, and start over? In that moment, at that breaking point, when she connected her relationship with God, it was a brand new page for her life from that moment on. God took everything from yesterday, wiped it away, and was brand new. From that moment, she had a brand new clean slate to start with. Here's how it happened with this gentleman. It says this, that later Jesus found this man at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. So stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Jesus says to this man, you've got it, you've got it together now. I've done the miracle. Now you need, to, you need to get it all under control. You need to forget about yesterday. You need to, don't go back to your old life. You need to put it all together. And I'm, I'm so proud of, of Jen and, and the process that she's come because I've watched as she's moved through this and what God's done in her life and how God's used her and how God has used her story to encourage other people to say, you know what? Anything can happen. I can do anything in your life. It doesn't matter who you are. And the negative thing about what we do and, and what God's allowed us to do is because, you know, she leads worship and, and, and I get to, you know, to minister the gospel and things like that, people look at us like, well, you guys just must not understand. You've probably got it all together. You don't have any problems. You know, you, you just tend to think that way. But by just sitting and, and just sharing our story of real life, that sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's not. But life is just life and we're all just people. But when we were able to say, look at what Jesus did, and never look back other than the fact that number four, what I put on your outline, or number five is to give credit to Jesus. That's the only time we look back, is just to give credit to Jesus. Here's what uh, the man said. He said he went away and told all the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. He left, went to all the people, said it's Jesus Christ who made me well. He's the one that made the difference. And this morning, what we wanted to let you know is that it's Jesus who makes you well. It's Jesus who makes all the difference. It's Jesus that gives you a brand new page to live out your life. Nothing that you can do, nothing that I can do. We can't be good enough. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And this morning, here's what I want us to do. I just want us to, I want us to all have the same opportunity that Jen had, just to go to God and say, you know what? I want that change in my life. I truly want to be brand new. And at Cultivate Church, we don't, we don't embarrass anybody or anything like that. All I ask you to do is just where you are, just to bow your head, close your eyes, and, and I want to be able to pray for you. Our worship team's going to come, and they're just going to play some music. Nobody's going to come get you or do anything weird. But this is the moment where, just as this man in Scripture, where you've got a decision to make. Is this the moment that you want to see God change your whole life? That you know everything can be different if you just surrender yourself to God. You have to make the effort. God is waiting, but you have to be the one to go to him and say, you know what, I, I want to give you my life right here. This is the day that I decide that I want to give it to you. And then you watch God do the, do the difference and, and everything change in your life, and then you just give credit to Jesus. You know, Pastor Brandon gave us in week one to, some resources to begin to learn how to put our story together. And there's a resource out on the information central that you can pick up learn how to write your story and last week I just encourage you to begin preparing to share it getting up the courage not to be scared to share your story and in this week I want you to walk away with a thought that the big idea is all you have to do is give Jesus credit for what he's done in your life and for some of you today you're about to have an opportunity to give Jesus credit because he's going to change your life and with nobody looking and nobody moving, I just want to know who I'm praying for. And I would just say, if that's you today, and, and you want to respond that way and just say, you know what, I've never made Jesus, number one, and I want to do that today. If maybe you just raise your hand where you are so I can see you, and so I just know who I'm praying for. So that as I pray and we go before God, I'll know that you want us to include you in this prayer to say, today is the day that I want to give Jesus my life. I can see your hand. Thank you for yours. 
Anybody else? Just real quick. I don't want to miss you. If you're here, people are already saying, yes, I, I want to give God everything. I want to give Jesus my life. We're going to pray for those people who responded. And, but I also want to pray for those who are here. Maybe you just feel like shame or guilt. Yesterday's weighing you down. And you really want to be able to overcome. But maybe you've just been discouraged. Or maybe you've just fought that battle. And you just like us to pray for you today. Just say, hey, you know, Pastor Brandon, just pray for me. That God would just give me the strength that I need. Just to keep giving him credit. And telling people for the reason that I hope that I have. If that's you and you want us just to include you in this prayer, maybe God will make you more bold in sharing your story. I just want you to slip up your hand. I see hands in the back, from the front to the back, left and right, lots of hands. I'm going to pray for you this morning. And here's the great thing about it. God's faithful. And this morning, he's listening and he knows. And God's going to set you free. Those of you that said, I want Jesus to have it all. And for those of you that want God just to help you to not to be bogged down by yesterday or to have the ability to share your story in a more powerful way. God's going to do that for you this morning. Father, we love you so much. Jesus, we just honor you. Because Jesus, you're what it's all about. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason that we have life, breath in our body. The reason that we wake up every day is because of you. You're the one who makes the difference in our life. It's not the church. The church is just a, a catalyst or a vehicle that makes it possible. But it's by the power of the Holy Spirit, by you living in our lives. And for the people who responded today by saying, I want to give Jesus my life, everything. Together, we just pray that you just forgive us of our sins. Wipe our slate clean. Give us a brand new page. We know that you're the Son of God. We know you gave your life on the cross. And we give you our life. Today, we are different because of you. We make a commitment that when we leave this place, we're committed to Jesus, to know about you, to learn about you, to live our life for you, to get connected in community in small groups, to begin to serve and use our gifts and our abilities so that other people will know that, Jesus, you're the, you're the difference maker. And for the people who responded by saying, I just need to be encouraged, I just need to be free from being bogged down of, of guilt or shame, or the people who said, I want to be able to share my story. I want the courage to do it. We just pray, God, that you just do the work in their life. God, that you just help them to be overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony so that we can make Jesus famous, so that we can give credit to you, so that other people's lives are changed. In Jesus' name.